All right. Welcome to TCCI. It's good to see all of you. Uh, some familiar faces, some people I, I've never met before, but we're glad you're here. Um, my name is Pastor Day. Uh, my Korean name is Day Kwan. I actually have an English name. It's Daniel. You can feel free to call me whatever you like, PD, P Day. But I'm Pastor Day. Um, and, you know, as we start the service, you know, I was really praying about what God wanted me to proclaim today and going forth on in this ministry. And, and the heart that I really got uh, from the Lord was that He wanted me to go back to the basics and really focus on uh, the essence of what it means to be a Christian, right? The essence of worship, right? A worship. And so what I'm going to preach today, what I'm going to share with you guys today is nothing new. You know, it's, it's, it's Christianity 101, if I must so say, if I must say so, right? Um, it's nothing that's going to wow your minds with persuasive speech or some words of wisdom of men. But I pray that as we focus and go back to this topic, this, this uh, issue of worship, that it would go forth and that our spirits would just get stirred up and grow a deep desire and a hunger and thirst for worship because that's what we were created for and that's why we're here today. Amen? Amen. So if you would please go with me uh, to the Word of God this afternoon. We're going to be looking at Romans chapter 12, verse 1 through 2. Very familiar verse. Romans chapter 12, verses 1 through 2. All right. And the Word of God reads, I beseech you, therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God, that you present your bodies a living sacrifice, wholly acceptable to God, which is your reasonable service. And do not be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind, that you may prove what is that good and acceptable and perfect will of God. Amen. So the title of today's message is, Worship Our Highest Calling. Worship Our Highest Calling. Because you and I, every one of us here, whichever background we may have come from, we were created to worship. Created to worship. That is the goal, that is the primary and greatest reason for our existence. It says in Isaiah 43, 21, that God, we are the people whom God has formed for himself that we might declare his praise. So we were created for this. This is why we exist. This is the purpose. This is the goal for all of existence. Now, before we get into what, uh, what he means by that, what is worship exactly? I want to take us back and kind of look at what the word worship actually means. And uh, I looked at the word, and the original meaning of this word actually has a direct relationship with the concept of worth with worth. So it comes from the word worship. Worship comes from worship. And so what you're doing when you're worshiping is you're actually looking at something and you're declaring the value, the worth that it has, right? And back in the days, you know, like when people got married, I think it was maybe in the 1600s, and in the church, men and women, uh, I think the man would take the ring and when he's putting the ring on the girl's finger, the, the bride's finger, he would say, with my body, I thee worship, right? And, you know, that's not good. That's idolatry, right? But, but anyways, the point was, he was saying, hey, you're valuable. I value you. You're so worthy, right? I, you're, I'm just declaring your praises. You're honorable. I honor you. You're lovable. I love you, right? And so when we worship God, what are we doing? We are actually declaring his worth. We are displaying and declaring and praising with our lips. You are valuable and worthy above all things. I treasure you. I delight in you. You're everything to me because his worth is supreme and infinite. Amen? Now, I guess in basic terms, you just say you give credit where credit is due. And this is, I mean, at least for me, this is the, the primary uh, conflict with, with man because I'm not going to lie. I get prideful when someone is better than me at something, right? It's so hard for me to worship God, and I can see it in my brothers. When I see someone that's better than me at something, all of a sudden, it's hard to ascribe that worth to him because I got this pride going on in my heart, right? 
But God calls us to let go of ourselves and worship him for who he is. And he is supreme and infinite. Now, when we're talking about worship, we're not just talking about singing and praising. And nowadays, it's a little bit difficult to get around that concept, right? Because you think of worship and automatically you think of music. I mean, let's be honest. We think of worship, we think of elevation or Bethel or upper room, right? Some of y'all smirked. I, I got you, right? It's true, though. You can't help it because of the culture that's been formulated around the word worship, right? But music in itself is not worship. It's not, it's not nothing in the Bible says that music is worship. But what is music? It is the expression of the worship that's already in us. It is a mere expression and a form of worship that can enrich your worship, that can help you worship, but it is not what actually allows you to worship. That's why Matthew 15, 8, Jesus says, This people honors me with their lips, but their heart is far from me. So what is he saying? You could be singing at the top of your lungs. You could be jumping up and down, doing whatnot, and you could have not have worshipped a moment, Right? So in other words, what is he saying? In other words, worship cannot be forced. It's not something that external circumstances can force upon a person. Now, if you look at this uh, the scripture, it actually speaks of spiritual worship in, uh, I think, ESV. And in the NKJV, as we read, it said reasonable service. Now, that word reasonable in the Greek is logikos meaning it pertains to logic or reason, right? So the word service is latreas, meaning the Levitical worship, the sacrifice of animals that they used to do in the Old Testament. So what's he saying? It's worship that pertains to the mind and in the inner man. Worship must come from the heart and it must flow outwards and express itself as praise or whatever it may be. That's why Jesus says, render your hearts and not your garments, right? Now, Paul goes into a little bit more detail and makes it clear, even clearer what true worship is. He says that worship is a lifestyle, a living sacrifice, right? A living sacrifice. And I can testify that this uh, convicts my heart because, man, I used to be a Sunday Christian. I'm not even going to lie, right? I used to be a Sunday Christian. Uh, I grew up as a pastor's kid. Uh, all my life, just in church, and it just became a routine, man, just going to church every Sunday. Two hours was my worship, right? Two hours was my worship. I'll go back and just go back to my same life, whatever it may be. And I don't know, some of you guys may know, some of you guys don't know, but I was very into rap. I was very into hip-hop, that culture. And, you know, when I moved to Korea five years ago, man, I was at a low. I was at a low. And, and you know, Sunday, I would go to church worship. Monday, I'd be out in the clubs doing whatnot, right? It was a very uh, partial worship. It was not a living sacrifice. He says to present your bodies as a living sacrifice, holy and acceptable to God, which is your spiritual worship. So it's as if you're placing yourself on that altar back in the Old Testament. You're placing yourself on that altar and sacrificing yourself, being crucified with Christ who has died, the perfect and final atonement for our sins. And you pick up that cross and you just deny yourself daily, every day, in and out. And that's the worship that he talks about. Why do we do that? Because Christ died for us and we are no longer our own. 1 Corinthians 6, verse 19 to 20. It reads this, Or do you not know that your body is the temple of the Holy Spirit who is in you, whom you have from God, and you are not your own? For you were bought at a price. Therefore glorify God in your body and in your spirit, which are God's. He says you are not your own anymore. You are no longer your own, your body and your spirit. And what does that body encompass? It's not just talking about the flesh. The flesh included but the body encompasses the mind and the will and the soul and the spirit, meaning none of you is you. No longer is that belong, does that belong to you. I bought all of you with my blood. That's what God is saying. And so he has the justification to say, hey, take all of you and now worship. 
worship, right? That continual giving of all of me to what he is and what he has done for me. And if we're not worshiping in this way, there is a problem. If we are not worshiping in this way as a Christian, it is a problem. If there is a portion of my life that I'm keeping from the Lord, whether it's my time or my money or my whatever, my relationship, that is a problem. And as for me, if worship lasted on Sundays for two hours, if worship ended five minutes ago when the song stopped, that is a problem. All of us, all the time is what he's calling us to do. And this might sound a little funny, but let me just tell you a little quick story. I had long hair just a couple weeks ago. So y'all know, I, my hair was like right around here, right? And you know, people used to call me, you know, mini Jesus or whatever, right? And um, I'm not very good at taking care of my, uh, what do you call it, appearance actually. I'm not, I'm, I don't like wax, I, I hate this to be honest. So I, I don't like it, it's messy. And so when my hair was long, it was very messy. And I was walking around the church and you know, people looking at me like, there's this homeless dude walking around, right? Now, because of this, and, and I'll explain further, my senior pastor actually told me, he just made a comment out of it, about it, right? He said, hey, you know, you're going to be, you know, in the pulpit and you're going to be kind of, you know, in the eyes of the public, right? So maybe it would be a good idea to, you know, just take care of your hair. That's what he said, take care of your hair. But he said it from a very loving standpoint, from a father's heart and, and from wisdom, right? And so he said that, and I, I took the take care of your hair as cut it, right? I mean, right? He said, take, you should take care of your hair. I said, okay, I got you, right? And so I knew I had the freedom to do what I wanted. There was absolutely no command. There was no, there was no spirit of control telling me or giving me pressure to, to cut my, whatever, right? But I cut it as you can see, right? I don't know if y'all see the, the before and after, if that was a good choice or not. I need some affirmation right now, you know, but uh, I cut it. But the reason I cut it was not because of his words. I did not cut it because he asked, he didn't even ask me, because he made that comment. I cut it because of what I discovered in my heart. And this might sound funny because it's just hair, right? But I discovered in my heart, I was battling for three days because of this issue, man. After he made that comment, I was like asking everyone, my friends, my peers, hey, should I cut my hair? You know, like, is that all right? I'm American, independence, you know, like, you can't control me. You know what I mean? Like, I do what I want. It's my hair. I've been growing it out so patiently for the past, like, seven months, right? That was a lot of effort, you know? But then I thought, I'm in the army of God, right? And no one bails on the army because they got to cut their hair right? It's like, man, I got to shave my head. I'm not going to the army. That, does, that just doesn't cut it. So why is that okay in church? And, and he didn't even ask me to cut my hair. He didn't even ask me for my life. He just made a, a comment of wisdom, right? And so I realized that there was this attachment to this small trivial thing that I could not give up. Why? Because I felt that it was mine, right? Mine. And some of y'all are tripping right now because you're like, oh, he's going to ask me to cut my hair. And so you're scared, but no, don't worry. I won't. But that pride had me in a rut for three days, so I decided to cut off, cut it off, literally, right? That attachment, literally. And that was my small act of obedience. To me, as small as that may sound, that was worship to me. Why? Because God isn't asking for huge things from you. He's asking you for small acts of obedience in your life. Amen? And it was understanding the heart of my authority as a father, right? and the wisdom that it carries, and just submitting it unto it as unto the Lord. Because worship encompasses every part of your life. He doesn't want a part of it. He wants the whole thing. A living sacrifice, not a dead, one-time deal kind of sacrifice. And when I think about this concept of living sacrifice, it always takes me back to Abraham and Isaac. And you guys know this story very well, right? Abraham, he waits for the son. He's like 100 years old. He takes him up. You know, God asked him to kill him so, or, you know, sacrifice him, right? So he takes him up, ties him up, about to plunge that knife into his chest. And then what happens? God says, no, don't, right? But what if he had? What if God didn't say no and, and Abraham killed his son? You know what that would have been? Isaac would have been a dead sacrifice. One-time deal, dead, burned up, gone. 
But the key here is that God was not looking for Isaac's dead sacrifice. He was looking for Abraham's living sacrifice. Amen? Now, what do I mean by that? What do I mean by that? Abraham would have been a living sacrifice. He was after Abraham's heart. The willingness. The willingness. Because the kind of worship that Abraham gave was not even, it was not a habit. It was not even a lifestyle. If he had killed Isaac, you know what that would have been? It would have been a reality of worship. His whole life and reality would have just changed instantly. That one son that he's been waiting for for, for a long time, that promise that God gave him, the covenant, all of it, Lord, I'm willing to just give it up and I'll live my whole life, my reality as a worship to you. That's the living sacrifice that God had intended to receive. And I asked myself, man, how many of us could do that? I stressed for three days about hair, you know? <laughs> how am I supposed to give my whole life? And, and could we really do it? Think about it, right? I mean, you know, can you give away your job, your career, your relationship, your children? That's unheard of, but that's the standard. For every believer, and it's no less than that. Now, we said that he created us to worship in this way. And he didn't just create us and then just expected us to do this. He gave us clear motivation. He gave us clear support and provision to be able to worship him in this way. He would never, God would never tell you to do something and then not give you uh, the power and the empowerment to be able to do that. That thing, right? And what was the reason? What was the reason? What is the reason that we can worship in this way? It's because he saved us. He saved us to worship. Right? We weren't just created as mere robots that he just wants to, you know, to worship him. He gave us a clear reason to worship him in this way. Now, Exodus 8:1 says this. And the Lord spoke to Moses: Go to Pharaoh and say to him, Thus says the Lord. Let my people go that they may serve me. Now, the word serve here is the same thing as earlier. Service, Levitical worship, offering up. It's worship, right? So why did Jesus come to the world and die for sinners? To raise up worshipers. What is the purpose of salvation? It is for worship. And I think John Piper says it best. Church exists because, and no, not church, missions exist because worship doesn't. That's the whole purpose of salvation, Right? Why though? Why is worship, Romans 12.1, the proper response and the natural outcome of salvation? Why? Well, Paul says, I appeal to you, therefore, brothers, by the mercies of God. He really focuses and, and emphasizes that part. The mercies of God. And what, what is the mercies of God? There's so many. But we can sum it up into what? We can sum it on into the work of the cross and the life of Jesus Christ. Undeserving sinners receiving mercy, receiving love, receiving grace in the life of Christ and in the cross. And why? Why does this allow us to worship? Because thanksgiving, thanksgiving, it creates thanksgiving in our hearts. If you realize and are convicted with the spirit of conviction that we are undeserving sinners, totally fallen, totally wicked, but God has chosen to come down and, and, and die on that cross, shedding his blood for us, and that we can join him in eternal fellowship, then that must create in us a heart of thanksgiving. And thanksgiving is the gateway into God's presence. Now, it takes me back to the story of Mary with the alabaster jar, right? She wipes, when she goes into the house with the Pharisees and Jesus, and she wipes the feet of Jesus with her tears, man. She's in tears. She, she wipes his feet and then she just pours this expensive alabast, alabaster jar of perfume on Jesus. And that's a worship that Jesus says will be remembered forever as, as long as the gospel is preached. And that's a pretty good hallmark right there. That's a, that's a good, uh, what do you call it? Achievement. Like no one has ever done before. Why? Luke seven forty seven says this. Therefore I tell you, her many sins have been forgiven, as her great love has shown, but whoever has been forgiven little, loves little. Jesus says it clearly. 
You are forgiven much, you love much. You're forgiven little, you don't know how bad you are. You don't understand the depths of your sin and your fallenness without Christ. You won't love him. You can't love him. The greater the forgiveness, the greater the thanksgiving. That's why Psalm 100 makes it clear that we are to enter into his gates with thanksgiving. The entry point is thanksgiving. Thanksgiving for what? The mercies of God, the cross. We don't worship him for nothing. We worship him because he loved us first. Amen? Romans 5.8 But God demonstrates his own love toward us in that while we were sinners, Christ died for us. This one verse is enough reason for us to just devote everything to him. On the way to the pit of hell, redeemed by the love and the mercy of Christ. This alone is, is enough for us to just give everything to him. And so, worship is always focused, always focused, like it says, by the mercies of God, always focused on the work of the cross. It's always centered around God. Worship is for God. Amen? It's not for us. Worship is not for us. So it's never about how we feel or what the atmosphere is like that day. Whether the person next to you is shouting or raising their hands in worship, that's not what directs our worship. What directs our worship is remembering what Christ has done for us on that cross. And that's where the heart of worship starts from. It produces thanksgiving in our hearts and compels us to love him back. So the cross is not the end goal. It is actually the beginning. It is where worship starts. It is where the Christian life starts. It is where everything starts. The motivation and basis of our worship. Now, he's created us to worship. He saved us to worship. But he goes further. He commands us to worship. Now, it's not commanding in the way that you think it is. And there's a story, right, of this, uh, I think it was a man and a woman, uh, husband and wife, right? two husband and wife stories in one sermon, right? Husband and wife. The husband asks the wife before she goes to sleep, must I kiss you goodnight? Right? And she said, yes, but not in the way that you think. Now, what does that mean? She's saying, yeah, yeah. I mean, we're husband and wife. You know, you got to show me your love. But I don't, wanna, I don't want your love out of duty. I don't want a, a, a non-genuine love. I, I want your real love heart, your heart and your genuine love towards me, right? So he's, he's commanding us to worship, but he's not that dad sitting at the table with the life, light half, you know, half off, just waiting for his son to come home to give him a whooping when he comes, right? He's not that kind of authoritative father commanding you, like, worship me, right? His command is a call and invitation of love, amen? His command is a call and invitation of love. Why? Did God place the tree of the knowledge of good and evil in that garden? People always ask, why would he put that there if, you know, he knew that they were going to fall and, you know, sin's going to happen? Why would he put that there? But it's simple. It's simple. He put that there because it's an invitation of love. It's an invitation and a calling to respond to his commandments out of a genuine and willing heart. And that's always how God works. That's always how God works. True worship must be a response to his commandments when he calls you to worship. Now, how do you get that willing and worshipful heart? Because let's be honest, some of us, you know, all of us actually, we don't feel like worshiping sometimes. We don't feel like worshiping sometimes. But David makes it clear for us. He says, Psalm 51, 12, Restore to me the joy of your salvation and uphold me with a willing spirit. Again, we see here, it always goes back to the cross. Joy of your salvation restored creates the willing spirit in our hearts. There's nothing, nothing else. It's very simple. We always go back to the cross and the mercies of God, what he has done for us, and that creates true worship in us. So God doesn't force us to do anything. If we are really and truly saved with the heart of thanksgiving, it's natural as an apple tree produces apples. 
It's natural. And so he never coerces. He always calls. He never intimidates. He always invites. He always woos and pursues after us with burning affections. Now, I, I work at uh, the, the school upstairs. There's a school on the seventh floor. It's called TCCS. Um, Christian, obviously Christian school, right? Uh, and, and I work there, and one of my coworkers, um, she's an she's older lady, but she is a prime example of this kind of love. I see her working with the children, right? And they're like second graders, third graders, and they really respect her. They really honor her as authority, and, and, and they trust her. There's this like weird, deep relationship that, first of all, mothers just carry with children, right? They just have that nurturing spirit. And no matter how nice, no matter how much candy I give them, I can never up her, you know what I mean? She just has that, right? So I, 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 I observed why is she able to do that? How is she able to do that, right? And I noticed one thing. When she wants to do something in the classroom, when she wants to just, you know, clean up the trash or, you know, clean the room or whatever, she always, always invites the children to participate in that activity with a willing spirit. She says, hey, Mary, do you, do you want to throw away this trash for me? Can you throw away this trash for me? It's not like, hey, Mary, throw, it, go, throw away the trash. You know? Or like, you know, Josh, go, go clean up the table. I, I do that. That's me. <laughs> That's me. But she's very inviting and loving and caring. And sometimes it comes off as a little bit more firm and, and stern. Sometimes it comes off as, you know, kind of kind. And, and, but the way that she does it never changes. And it creates this deep trust uh, towards her from the children. Now, in the same way, God is speaking through Paul here in this verse. Romans 12, 1 again, he says, I beseech you, I appeal to you. Now that word beseech is old language, right? It's, it's, it's a word for begging. He's begging you to worship. And if you look at the Greek, it actually comes from the word parakleos, which is actually Holy Spirit, but connected to the word comfort. So this is a very gentle and tender and affectionate way of asking you and begging you, hey, Romans 1 through 11, this is what God has done. This is his love. This is his mercy. Now we're at 12. What should you do? Please worship him. Please, please, as your fellow brother. And he's expressing God's heart, his passionate, burning invitation towards his children. Why? Why is he inviting us to worship though? What's the point of it? John 15, 9, 11 gives us a clue. It says, As the Father loved me, I also have loved you. Abide in my love. If you keep my commandments, you will abide in my love. Just as I have kept my Father's commandments and abide in his love. These things I have spoken to you that my joy may remain in you and that your joy may be full. So in other words, when we keep his commandments, we find our greatest joy in life. Amen? And what does God command us to do first and foremost? Matthew 22, verses 37 to 38, he says, Jesus said to him, You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, and with all your mind. This is the first and great commandment. The first and foremost thing that he calls us to do is just to love and be loved by him. That's it. And this is the perfection of human life. This is the highest goal. This results in the greatest satisfaction for you. Why do we worship? Because it glorifies God and it is the best thing for us. Amen? He calls us to worship not out of vanity, but because he loves us and because he is holy he desires to be with us and he is holy. And no wonder, it's no wonder that he says, be holy for I am holy. Many people think this is a pressure statement. Hey, follow these rules and these commandments so that you can enter into my presence. But it's not, a press, it's not pressure that he's giving you. He is holy and his presence is not something to be lightly taken. He's saying, hey, be holy because I want to be with you. I'm inviting you. I'm calling you out of a place 
of love. And that's why he sent Jesus, so that we could do that. And it's no wonder that God says to Apostle John in Revelation chapter 4, come up here, come up here. He's inviting, once again, God is inviting you wherever you are in your life right now. However many scars you have, whatever sins that you've committed in the past, what he's saying right now is come up here. You're here for a reason. Come up here. And what is that scene? It is a scene of eternal worship. Eternal worship. Just like Psalm 100 says, through a heart of thanksgiving and the praise of your lips so that we can enter into the holy of holies, which is where God's presence is. He wants fellowship with you. And this reminds me, of one last story, it reminds me of Hosea, who I can imagine would have gone to that auction. And we all know the story of Hosea. He goes to that auction and he's going to buy back his own wife his own wife that he's already married, he's going to buy her back with the little money, but all the money that he has, he pays it for her, and he purchases her back. And then what does he say? He leaves, it, he leaves her at his house, and he just says, just stay here. Stay here for a while. What's he saying? It's like he's saying, hey, I gave everything for you. Now, you don't have to do anything. Just be here and be with me. Just love me and be loved by me. That's the invitation. That's the invitation that he's giving. Abide in my love and love me. Why? Because you don't want to go back to that world. You don't want to go back to that life, that rut that you were coming from. I purchased you so that you can be loved and that you can love me. Just stay here. This is the best thing for you. The best thing for you. And what would a proper response be to that kind of love? Thanksgiving. Praise and worship. And so for those who have experienced God's mercy, worship is the greatest and highest calling. It's an invitation that God is giving right now to love him because he already loved you and made a way for you to do so. Amen? That gives freedom. That breaks addictions. The worship of God, loving God, provides so much more satisfaction than anything that you can think about in this world. Man, I used to be back in the clubs, in the tours, whatever, performing, trying to be successful with rap and, and make it as a star and earn money and do this and that. But man, that, those were the worst years of my life, man. The worst years of my life. They really were. And I liked rap. I still like rap. I do. But I didn't have Jesus back then. I really did not know Jesus. I was worshiping everything but Jesus. And my life was a living hell. It was. And I can see why Paul, again, after 11 chapters, 11 chapters of describing all of God's characters and his mercy and his righteousness and his grace and his love, the first thing is not be merciful as Christ was merciful. It's not, hey, God did this for you, so you do the same for others. He didn't say that. He said, this is the mercy that God has shown us now worship him, right? So before a life that is merciful, our life must be worshipful, worshipful. And there is a reason. The first commandment is the first commandment to love the Lord God with all of our hearts, minds, and souls because this is the offering up of our bodies. This is the living sacrifice that God desires. This is God's heart to want to be with us. Amen? Worship precedes all other things in the Christian life and everything proceeds from worship. We must never forget this. Let me say that one more time. Worship precedes everything in the Christian life. It's not about ideas or ideologies or opinions or whatever, what side of the spectrum. It's about worshiping and loving the Lord our God for what he has done for us. That is the gospel. And from that place, Everything else follows. Everything else follows. Amen? Let's pray, church. Worship team, could you come up, please? We're going to pray for two things today. First thing we're going to pray is this. We're going to pray that the Lord would take us back to the revelation of the cross. We are the Cross Church International. And we are the Cross Church International for a reason. We never... We never want to get to a point in our Christian walk, in our lives, 
where we cannot reflect on the work of the cross. Some people think, hey, that stuff's basic. That stuff's basic. Why do we need to go back to that all the time? That is where everything starts. The cross is where everything starts. Because the cross creates thanksgiving in our hearts. Forgiveness and mercy create thanksgiving in our hearts. There's the story of the ten lepers. Ten lepers cry out to Jesus. They're sick. They're dying. They're desperate for Jesus. And they cry out to him, Jesus, save us. And Jesus says, go, you'll be healed. They start walking. Ten go, one come back. One comes back and says, hey, thank you. And you know what the verse says? It says he came back with a glorious cry. He, he shouted at the top of his lungs, crying out to God in worship from a place of thanksgiving. And that was what brought him back to the presence of God. That's what gave him salvation. Ten were healed. Only one was saved. What was the differentiating factor? It was a heart of thanksgiving, understanding of the mercy of God, and that created true worship. So Father God, we ask you right now, restore in us, Lord, the joy of salvation. Help us to meditate on the work of the cross that while we were sinners, Christ came down and died for us bled for us and resurrected and that we may be raised up into eternal fellowship with him Jesus father we ask that you pour out that heart of thanksgiving a deep deep gratitude whether you're a believer or not for God has sent his son his only begotten son that whoever believes in him shall not perish but have eternal life there is a way for everyone in this world, for all of creation who was created to worship, but he has gone farther than creating. He has saved us and given us reason and given us power to worship him because that is the best thing for us. So Lord Jesus, we ask that you pour out that spirit of thanksgiving, that heart of thanksgiving in our hearts. Church, I just want to invite you to lift up your voices, lift up your voices and ask him to restore that joy, that joy of salvation in our hearts the mercies of God his eternal love his infinite mercy that we may worship him with a genuine and a willing a worshipful heart let's pray church yes Lord Jesus we ask you pour out thanksgiving in our hearts God pour out thanksgiving in our hearts Jesus as you release deeper revelation of the work of the cross God deeper revelation of the life of Christ Jesus help us to never never bypass the marvelous work of the cross Jesus yes Lord Jesus pour out thanksgiving into our hearts that we may enter into your gates that we may enter into your courts with praise that we may accept your invitation of love, Jesus. That we may accept your call to worship and be with you for eternity, Jesus. Yes. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you for the cross. Thank you for your blood that has given us access to the throne. Your blood that has given us access to the throne of grace, to the throne of mercy, to obtain grace and mercy in time of need, Lord Jesus. Yes, Lord Jesus. We thank you. We thank you. Yes, Jesus. Because of the work of the cross, God. Produce thanksgiving in our hearts. 30, 60, and 100 for Lord. 
that we may offer up our bodies, our hearts, minds, souls, our will, all of it to you as a living sacrifice, God. Yes, Jesus. Living sacrifice, Jesus. high and dry but you made a way we accept your invitation God we approach you boldly yes Jesus made a way for us Jesus thank you Jesus Pour out your heart, Father. Connect us to your heart, Father your desire to be with your children your desire to be with your children God Holy Spirit pour out the love of the Father in our hearts yes Jesus fill us with your spirit me up God fill us with your spirit restoring us your first commandment to love you wholeheartedly sold out for you Jesus intimacy with you father Lord the Lord has called every one of us here today for a reason the Lord has something he wants to say to every one of us here today and I believe that he wants to show us the desires of his heart as a father Romans 8 says this it says that he did not give us a spirit of bondage again to fear but the spirit of adoption the spirit of his son by whom we cry out Abba Father Father God we pray right now Lord that you would break any bondages 
heal any scars any addiction and any grip and any stronghold father we command it to be broken right now in Jesus name and we ask for the kingdom of God the house of the father to be established in our hearts and in this place that you would give us the spirit of adoption by whom we could boldly cry out to you as sons intimacy that gives us boldness to cry out to you as father the father is seeking us today he's calling us today and saying worship me he's saying love me as a son not as a servant not as just a program but as a son who loves me through intimacy through the work of the cross and I've given you the spirit of my son to do so so beloved I just want to invite you to lift up your voices and cry out to him father God Abba father Abba father we worship you we love you break every chain break every chain and addiction loosen every bondage in our hearts God and he scars from the past God we ask that you would heal it every wound would you heal it in Jesus name break down every stronghold every grip of the enemy in our hearts God release us from that in Jesus name no more bondage or get to fear no more going back to that life but there's a new life a better life of eternal wonderful communion with the Lord waiting for each and every one of us here yes Lord Jesus we cry out to you Abba Father Abba Father yes God as sons and daughters as sons and daughters yes God connect us to your heart your heart God the heart of a father the desire to be with his children yes Lord
Father, this is our confession. To whom shall we go? Where else would I find satisfaction? You have the words of eternal life. You are the living water and we come thirsty, Jesus. We come hungry and thirsty from all the other pursuits of our lives. And we confess that you are the source of eternal and living water would you be our greatest satisfaction would your your joy be in our hearts that our joy may be full Lord we accept your invitation your call to love God now would you give us a deeper deeper understanding through the spirit of wisdom and revelation in the knowledge of who you are the deeper revelation of the work of the cross the life of Christ Jesus that we may truly worship you out of a heart of thanksgiving Father give us hearts of thanksgiving give us joy the joy of salvation and create in us a willing a willing Spirit Jesus yes Lord we thank you for the word that you've spoken to us today we thank you we thank you we praise you and we worship you Jesus not just a portion of our lives but we offer up all of our bodies Jesus we offer up our mind heart body soul spirit all to you Jesus and we present it to you, Lord, as a living sacrifice, as a living sacrifice, Jesus. Would you be glorified? Would you be glorified, Lord? And restore the first commandment in our hearts, Jesus. Intimacy with you, Jesus. We thank you. We love you. And we pray all of this in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen.